The Loves of the Sea and Galatea by Alexander Charles Guillemot. A sea and Galatea are characters from Greek mythology later associated together in Ovid's Metamorphoses. The episode tells of the love between the mortal a sea and the Nereid Galatea, when the jealous Cyclops Polyphemus kills a sea, Galatea transforms her lover into an immortal river spirit. The episode was made the subject of poems, operas, paintings, and statues in the Renaissance and after. Galatea or Galatea, the glorious and comely daughter of the old man of the sea near use and the Oceanodorus. Was a sea nymph anciently attested in the work of both Homer and Hesiod, where she is described as the fairest and most beloved of the fifty Nereids. She lived in the sea and aroused the love of a most improbable suitor, the Sicilian Cyclops Polyphemus. In Ovid's Metamorphoses, Galatea appears as the beloved of a sea, the son of Faunus and the river nymph Samethes, daughter of the river Samethus. One day, when Galatea was lying beside the sea with her lover, Polyphemus saw them. The latter, in his jealousy, tore an enormous boulder out of the side of Mount Etna and then hurled it at the young man. Although a sea tried to flee, the huge rock crushed him beneath to death. Galatea then turned his blood into sparkling waters as it trickled from under the rock, so creating the stream on Etna that bore his name, the Sicilian River a sea. She turned her lover himself into the horned god of the stream. He retained his original features except that he was larger and his face was now a deep blue. This version of the tale now occurs nowhere earlier than in Ovid's work and might perhaps have been a fiction invented by the poet, suggested by the manner in which the little river springs forth from under a rock. But according to the Greek scholar Athenaeus, the story was first concocted by Philoxenus of Cathera as a political satire against the Sicilian tyrant Dionysius I of Syracuse, whose favorite concubine, Galatea, shared her name with the nymph. Others claim that the story was invented to explain the presence of a shrine dedicated to Galatea on Mount Etna. According to a later tradition Galatea eventually yielded to Polyphemus' embraces. Their son, Galas or Galat, became the ancestor of the Gauls. The Hellenistic historian Timaeus, who was of Sicilian birth, described Galat as a son of Polyphemos and Galatea. Galatea together with Dodo and Panope, escorted her sister Thetis out of the sea to her wedding with Peleus. In Homer's Iliad, Galatea and her other sisters appear to Thetis when she cries out in sympathy for the grief of Achilles at the slaying of his friend Patroclus. An 1822 French Empire mantle clock depicting Galatea. The design on its frieze is based on Raphael's fresco during Renaissance and Baroque times the story emerged once more as a popular theme. In Spain, Luis de Góngora y Argote wrote the much-admired narrative poem, Fabula de Polifemo e Galatea, published in 1627. It is particularly noted for its depiction of landscape and for the sensual description of the love of a sea in Galatea. It was written in homage to an earlier and rather shorter narrative with the same title by Luis Carrillo y Sotomayor. The story was also given operatic treatment in the very popular Zarzuela of Antoni Literacario. The atmosphere here is lighter and enlivened by the inclusion of the clowns Momo and Tisd. In France, Jean Baptiste Lully devoted his opera Sea at Galatea to their love. Described by him as a pastoral heroic work, it depicts a love triangle between the three main characters, a sea, Galatea, and Polypheme. Polypheme murders a sea out of jealousy, but a sea is revived and turned into a river by Neptune. In Italy Giovanni Bonancini's one-act opera Polyphemo followed in 1703. Shortly afterwards George Friedrich Handel was working in that country and composed the cantata ACI, Galatea e Polyphemo, laying as much emphasis on the part of Polyphemo as on the lovers. Written in Italian, Polyphemo's deep bass solo Fra Lombra e Glorori establishes his character from the start. After Handel's move to England, he gave the story a new treatment in his pastoral opera C and Galatea with an English libretto provided by John Gay. Initially composed in 1718, the work went through many revisions and was later to be given updated orchestrations by both Mozart and Mendelssohn. As a pastoral work where Polyphemus plays only a minor, though decisive part, it largely centers on the two lovers. While staying in London, Nicola Porpora composed the opera Polyphemo which features a sea and Galatea as well as the former's encounter with Polyphemus. In Austria later in the century, Joseph Haydn composed a sea de Galatea. Designed for an imperial wedding, it was given a happier ending centered on the transformation scene after the murder of a sea as the pair declare their undying love. Paintings featuring a sea and Galatea can be grouped according to their themes. Most notably the story takes place within a pastoral landscape in which the figures are almost incidental. 
This is particularly so in Nicolas Poussin's landscape with Polyphemus and Claude Lorraine's seaside landscape of 1657, in both of which the lovers play a minor part in the foreground. In an earlier painting by Poussin the couple is among several embracing figures in the foreground, shielded from view of Polyphemus, who is playing his flute higher up the slope. In all of these Polyphemus is somewhere in the background, but many others feature Galatea alone, as in Perino del Vaga's painting of her being drawn by sea beasts over the waves while riding on a seashell. Generally, though, the nymph is carried through the sea by adoring attendants in paintings generally titled The Triumph of Galatea, of which the most renowned treatment is by Raphael. In general these follow the 3rd century description given of such a painting by Philostratus the Younger in his Imagines, the nymph. Sports on the peaceful sea, driving a team of four dolphins yoked together and working in harmony, and maiden daughters of Triton. Galatea's servants, guide them, curving them in if they try to do anything mischievous or contrary to the rain. She holds over her heads against the wind a light scarf of sea purple to provide a shade for herself and a sail for her chariot, and from it a kind of radiance falls upon her forehead and her head though no white more charming than the bloom on her cheek, her hair is not tossed by the breeze, for it is so moist that it is proof against the wind. And lo, her right elbow stands out and her white forearm is bent back, while she rests her fingers on her delicate shoulder, and her arms are gently rounded, and her breast project, nor yet is beauty lacking in her thigh. Her foot, with the graceful part that ends in it, is painted as on the sea and it lightly touches the water as if it were the rudder guiding her chariot. Her eyes are wonderful, for they have a kind of distant look that travels as far as the sea extends. In those cases where the rejected lover Polyphemus appears somewhere ashore, the division between them is emphasized by their being identified with their respective elements, sea, and land. Typical examples of this were painted by François Perrier, Giovanni Lanfranco and Jean-Baptiste Van Loo. Sensual portrayals of the lovers embracing in a landscape were provided by French painters especially, as in those by Charles de la Fosse, Jean-Francois de Troyes and Alexander Charles Guillemot. Polyphemus lurks in the background of these and in the example by de Troyes' his presence plainly distresses Galatea. Other French examples by Antoine Jean Gross and Edouard Zier show the lovers hiding in a cave and peering anxiously out at him. They anticipate the tragic moment when he looms menacingly over the pair, having discovered the truth they have tried to conceal. The threat is as apparent in Jean-Francois de Troyes softly outlined 18th-century vision as it is in Odilon Redon's almost surrealist painting of 1900. The brooding atmosphere in these suggests the violent action which is to follow. That had been portrayed in earlier paintings of Polyphemus casting a rock at the fleeing lovers, such as those by Nibale Karachi, Augur Lucas and Carl Van Loo. Statues of Galatea, sometimes in the company of a sea, began to be made in Europe from the 17th century. There is a fanciful description of a fountain that incorporates them both in John Barclay's Latin novel Arhenis, dating from 1621, being drawn to the top of the fountain. The water passed through many pipes in various forms, then falling into the cistern beneath, it boiled with the force of its falling and waxed green like the sea. In the midst whereof, Galatea, as in the sea, bewailed her newly dead a sea, who lay on the shore, and as if he now began to be dissolved into a river, he sent forth two streams, one at his mouth, the other at his wound. An actual statue by a pool in the public gardens of Acurial, the Sicilian town where the transformation of a sea is supposed to have taken place, is less ingenious. He lies beneath the boulder that has killed him while Galatea crouches to one side, an arm raised to heaven in supplication. French sculptors have also been responsible for some memorable statues. There are a pair by Jean-Baptiste Tuby in the Bosquet des Dômes in the Versailles Gardens. As sea leans on a rock, casually playing the flute as the half-clad Galatea comes upon him with hands lifted in surprise. A similar gesture is displayed in the statue of her alone in the fountain to the right of the great staircase at Chateau de Chantilly. The lovers are portrayed together as part of the Medici fountain in the Luxembourg Garden in Paris. Designed by Auguste Auden in 1866, the marble group embrace inside a grotto while above them is crouched a huge polyphemus in withered bronze, peering down in jealousy. Many other statues feature Galatea alone, but there is a complication. Sometime after the Renaissance, the same name was given to Pygmalion's animated statue and one has to distinguish between representations of her and of the nymph Galatea. One pointer is given by the introduction of features mentioned in the description of the nymph by Philostratus that is quoted above. These include one hand raised and holding a billowing scarf, sea imagery, including shells, dolphins and tritons, and often the fact that the statue is incorporated into a fountain. 
In the work by Gabriel de Grupello in the castle park at Schwetzingen, the triton at Galatea's feet holds up a garland threaded with shells and pearls. The Galatea in the grounds of Tsarskoy Selo in Russia has sea pearls threaded into her hair. There is also a statue of her by Nikola Machetti that forms part of the cascade at the Peterhof Palace in St. Petersburg. The nymph reclines on a large shell carried by tritons in the 18th century fountain at the Villa Borromeo Visconti Lita in Milan. It is on the back of a dolphin that she reclines in the statue by the 19th century Italian sculptor Leopoldo Ancilioni. There are two versions of this, one at the center of a fish pool in the east house of the University of Greenwich's Winter Gardens, and a later copy installed at Hearst Castle in California. In this, one of the arms bent back to support her head is encircled by the dolphin's tail. There is also a German fountain by Karl Friedrich Moest now installed in Karlsruhe, in which Galatea sits on the back of a triton. Over her head she balances the huge shell from which the water pours. Another statue was erected at the head of an impressive cascade in Stuttgart's Eugenplatz. A work of Otto Reith dating from 1890, it features the nymph crowned with seaweed and surging up from the dolphin and young cupids playing at her feet. In the applied arts, three-dimensional representations of Raphael's triumph theme were often incorporated into artifacts for aristocratic use and were painted on majolica ware. This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Smith, William, ed. Dot. S.C. Dictionary of Greek and Roman Biography and Mythology. Thanks for watching.